Our script, you get to sit down during the reading of the Bible today because we're going to read two chapters. The first one's not that long. The second one is that long. Uh, but they go together. And so uh, listen very carefully to every word of chapter 5 and chapter 6 of the book of Exodus. Hear the word of God. Exodus 5 and 6. And afterward Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says Jehovah, the God of Israel, Let my people go, that they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. But Pharaoh said, Who is Jehovah, that I should obey his voice to let Israel go? I do not know Jehovah. And besides, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go a three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to Jehovah our God, lest he fall upon us with pestilence or with the sword. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. Again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their labors. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters over the people and their foremen, saying, You are no longer to give the people straw to make bricks, as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. But the quota of bricks which they were making previously, you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it, because they're lazy Therefore they cry out, Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let the labor be heavier on the men, and let them work as at it that they may pay no attention to false words. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen went out and spoke to the people, saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves, Wherever you can, find it, but none of your labor will be reduced. So the people scattered through the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw. And the task mayor's uh, masters pressed them, saying, Complete your work quota, your daily amount, just as when you had straw. Moreover, the foreman of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had said over them, were beaten and were asked, Why have you not completed your required amount either yesterday or today in making brick as previously? Then the foreman of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, Why do you deal with us this way, your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, yet they keep saying to us, Make bricks. And behold, your servants are being beaten, but it is the fault of your own people. But he said, you're lazy, very lazy. Therefore, you say, let us go and sacrifice to Jehovah. So go now and work, for you shall be given no straw, yet you must deliver the quota of bricks. And the foremen of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told, you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they said to them, may the Lord look upon you and judge you, for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of his servants to put a sword in their hands to kill us. 
Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, O Jehovah, O Lord, why hast thou brought harm to this people? Why didst thou ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he has done harm to this people, and thou hast not delivered thy people at all. Then Jehovah said to Moses, Now you shall see what I will do to Pharaoh. For under compulsion he shall let them go, as under compulsion he shall drive them out of his land. God spoke further to Moses and said to him, I am Jehovah. And I appeared to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as God Almighty. But by my name, Jehovah, I did not make myself known to them. And I also established my covenant with them <coughs> to give them the land of Canaan, the land in which they sojourned. So furthermore, I have heard the groaning of the sons of Israel because the Egyptians are holding them in bondage, and I have remembered my covenant. Say therefore to the sons of Israel, I am Jehovah, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from their bondage, and I will also redeem you with an outstretched arm with great judgments. Then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am Jehovah, your God, who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And I will bring you to the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you for a possession. I am Jehovah. So Moses spoke thus to the sons of Israel, but they did not listen to Moses on account of their despondency and cruel bondage. Now the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Go tell Pharaoh, king of Egypt, to let the sons of Israel go out of his land. But Moses spoke before Jehovah, saying, Behold, the sons of Israel have not listened to me, how then will Pharaoh listen to me? For I am unskilled in speech. Then Jehovah spoke to Moses and to Aaron and gave them a charge to the sons of Israel and to Pharaoh king of Egypt to bring the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt. These are the heads of their father's household, the sons of Reuben, Israel's firstborn, Hanak and Pelu, Hezron and Carmi. These are the families of Reuben. The sons of Simeon, Jemuel and Jamin and Ohad and Jachin and Zophar and Shaul, the son of a Canaanite woman. These are the families of Simeon. <coughs> and these are the names of the sons of Levi according to their generations. Gershon and Kohath and Merari, and the length of Levi's life was 137 years. The sons of Gershon, Libni, and Shimei, according to their families. And the sons of Kohath, Amran, and Ishar, and Ebron, and Uziel. And the length of Kohath's life was 133 years. And the sons of Merari, Meli, and Mushi, these are the families of the Levites according to their generations. And Amran married his father's sister, Jochebed, and she bore him Aaron and Moses, and the length of Amran's life was 137 years. Sons of Ishar, Korah, Nephig, and Zikri, and the sons of Uziel, Michael and Elzaphan and Sithri. And Aaron married Elizabeth, the daughter of Ammon, 
Nadab, the sister of Nashon, and she bore him Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar, and the sons of Korah, Aser and Elkanah, and Abiasath. These are the families of the Korites. And Aaron's son, Eleazar, married one of the daughters of Putiel, and she bore him Phinehas. These are the heads of the father's households of the Levites, according to their families. It was the same Aaron and Moses to whom the Lord said, Bring out the sons of Israel from the land of Egypt, according to their hosts. They were the ones who spoke to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, about bringing out the sons of Israel from Egypt. It was the same Moses and Aaron. Now it came about on the day when Jehovah spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt, that Jehovah spoke to Moses saying, I am Jehovah. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. But Moses said to Jehovah, Behold, I am unskilled in speech. How then will Pharaoh listen to me? Write a chapter. Let me tell you some things about this situation before we look at some of the details. Years ago, Gary North wrote a very useful commentary on Exodus that I recommend to you uh, called Moses and Pharaoh. And he began that commentary with this sentence. The, those who seek power apart from God are doomed to total comprehensive defeat. And those who seek God are called to exercise dominion. And they shall be victorious over all the enemies of God. That's what all this is about. You can make these two applications. Still as true today as they were back then. When you, when a nation, when anybody seeks power, Apart from the living God, they are doomed to constant, obedient, total defeat. What happened to Pharaoh? Pharaoh thought he was the most powerful man in the world. Thought to maintain his power, to expand his power, no matter what he had to do. And the more he sought power for himself, <coughs> the weaker he became. And the weaker Egypt became until the whole country of Egypt was destroyed because Pharaoh tried to find power apart from God. On the other hand, if you seek God, with your heart and soul, you will have power over other people. You will have dominion. You'll be able to be in a position to accomplish things that other people cannot accomplish. If you seek God with all of your heart and soul and strength and mind, you will have power. If you seek power without God, you will have constant comprehensive defeat. So, both Enemies of God and children of God both seek power. There's a difference between them. What do you think that difference is? Ethics. People of God seek power with eth ethics. That they want power to be able to accomplish something good and righteous in the world. And they're not going to seek power apart from the Word of God, but only in terms of the Word. Whereas the enemies of God seek power uh, in pure pragmatism 
Whatever they think works, they're going to do. Whatever they want, they, they're going to do. So understand, both Christians, both the Hebrews and the Egyptians sought power. The Egyptians sought power apart from God, and they were brought to total defeat. The Hebrews sought to know God, the Lord, with all their heart, soul, strength, and mind, and God gave them power to build a great culture in the land of Canaan and to plunder the Egyptians. Exodus chapter 1 through chapter 15, especially chapter 5 through chapter 15, is about a total war between Jehovah and the gods of Egypt. Get that down. Write that on your inside of your eyelids. That's what this whole section, chapter 5 through chapter 15, is about. It's about a total war that Jehovah is waging against all the gods of Egypt. Now, you know all about the plagues. You know about the frogs and the lice and the grasshoppers and the river turned to blood and all those various other things. But you may not have known that all those were gods of Egypt. And in killing Egypt with the frogs and with the crickets and with the lice and with the beetles and with the Nile River, he was making the gods of, it, of Egypt look completely impotent and worthless. So this was a war that was going on, waged by the Lord God himself to show how impotent Pharaoh and his gods were. Now, this passage of Scripture answers two questions that you've got to make sure you've answered today because they're the same two questions that we have to answer in our lifetime. And here's the question these chapters answered. Who is God and whose is Israel? Who is God, and to whom does Israel belong? That was the whole fight was all about. Pharaoh claimed to be God, one of the gods of the many gods of Egypt. He expected people to worship him. He expected the Hebrews to worship him. He said, uh, who is this Jehovah? I don't know him. I don't know anything about him. I don't even want to talk to him. I don't even talk to me. I don't want to have anything to do with this Jehovah. I don't belong to him. Egypt doesn't belong to him. Israel doesn't belong to him. Everything belongs to me, and I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove that everything in Egypt belongs to me. And that that God that the Hebrews worship is worthless. And the Hebrews, they think they belong to themselves. They think they belong to their, their God and can do whatever he, he wants them to do. The Hebrews are my slaves. My ancestors enslaved them a long time ago. They came here, they took our land, they took our wealth, they became very mighty and very numerous, and then we taught them a lesson. They thought they belonged to their God, and we showed them who they belonged to. So we enslaved them, we took away their rights to own private property, caused them to be uh, property of the state, And we made him work for us, building my pyramids. And so they wouldn't forget that they belonged to me and not to their God. 
not going to give him any straw to build their bricks with. And they had a certain amount of bricks they had to make every day out of mud. You make bricks out of mud and straw, and then you dry them. Pharaoh said, I'm not giving them any straw. They've got to make the same amount of bricks as they've always made, but they can't have any straw. And if they're one brick short, I'm going to have my taskmasters beat them because I want these Hebrews to know they belong to the state. Whom do you belong? Whose lordship do you confess over your life? Are you willing to say before the world, I belong to Jesus Christ, and I obey him no matter what it's going to cost me? I'm going to bow before him and live in terms of his word. Or are you going to say to Mr. Pharaoh, uh, Mr. Pharaoh, tell me what to do and I'll do it. Yes, sir. I belong to you. You want my children? My children belong to the state. So take them. Put them in your schools. You want me to pay their, uh, my pr uh, taxes for my property? Yes, sir, my property is your property. And I'll pay the taxes that you want me to pay. No rebellion, no resistance, no insurrection. I will do whatever my Lord who owns me tells me what to do. By, you, by the way, you know, that's what income tax is. Income tax is a tax on you. Not just on your money, but it's a tax on you and your ability to, ability to make money. You think you own free, free and clear your property? Try not paying your property taxes. See who gets your property. So this story is very up to date. Who is God? Who's in control of life? And to whom does Israel belong? Does Israel and her children belong to the state? Which is what the state still believes. They still believe it. Your children are their children. Or do you and your children belong to the living God? Every aspect of civilization is at stake in this war. Every aspect of Egyptian civilization was at stake in how you answer those two questions. And every aspect of American civilization is at stake by how you answer those two questions. Now, to understand this war between Jehovah and Pharaoh, you got to understand Pharaoh. That is, you got to understand Pharaoh's religion. It's not that hard to figure out. Because everything about Egypt's culture was determined by the religion of Pharaoh. You remember we said a few weeks back that the, that the, most, that the most massive bureaucracy in the history of the world was the bureaucracy of the Egyptian government. There's never been as massive, all-controlling bureaucracy of a country until modern America and modern Soviet Union. Now the question is, why was Egypt's bureaucracy so massive? If I could write, I'd draw you a picture. Because in, in this picture, Tells you everything you need to know about the philosophy of Egypt. You know, 
the shape of a pyramid, right? You know why pyramids are shaped like pyramids? Because that's the way Pharaoh saw life. I'm at the top. Here's Pharaoh, the most important human being in the world, and down here is the mass of Egyptian slaves. So why not use all of them to build me a pyramid? That's all they're worth. The only person of any value is the person at the pinnacle of that pyramid. Everybody else is a bureaucrat. Everybody else is a slave, building a grave for Pharaoh. But there's another pyramid involved. Pharaoh's religion looks like this. There's a pyramid. Top of the pyramid is Pharaoh. Down here are the mass of worthless human beings. But then there's another turned upside down pyramid sitting on top of this pyramid. So you got this pyramid, all the people down here, Pharaoh at the top. You got this turned upside down pyramid with Pharaoh at the bottom. And all the rest of the gods of Egypt. So when Pharaoh dies, he's got to start all over again and work his way up to be an important God. And that's Egyptian religion. Now, there are three religions in the world. Three kinds of religion. You can put all the other all the religions of the world into one of these three categories. And all of those religions are illustrated in the book of Exodus. You have power religion. Our religion was the religion of Pharaoh. Get, keep, expand, power, no matter what you have to do or who you have to step on. That's power religion. Get power, most important thing in life is not getting wealth, it's getting power. If you get wealth, you get wealth so that you can have more power. The whole story of life is having power over other people so that you can do to them and with them whatever you have a will to do. You don't believe that? Ask Winston in Orwell's 1984. Ask Nancy Sinatra. Nancy Sinatra put in song the theme George Orwell's 1984 book on totalitarianism. Uh, the state looked at poor old Winston, who wanted freedom, but he couldn't be freedom. He wanted truth, but there wasn't such a thing as truth. And so they would beat him. The state would beat him just for the sake of letting Winston know they have the power to beat him. He didn't do anything wrong. And so the state looked at Winston and said, Winston, you want to know what the future looks like? It's a boot stomping on a human face forever. So Nancy Sinatra saying, these boots are made for walking all over you. So power religion is the religion of big governments, the religion of men who want power above everything else. They want to be able to tell what people what to do. They want to exert their will no matter that what that will is. 
They don't want anybody in their way, and it doesn't matter who they have to step on or what they have to say or what kind of lies they have to make. That, that, that is the religion of the, gov- of the politics of the United States. That's the religion of the Democrat Party. Do you think the Democrat Party's purpose is to go out here and restore the United States Constitution and the Bill of Rights? so that everybody will have more freedom and there'll be less lawlessness? No. The purpose of the Democratic Party is power. Keep, get, keep, and expand power. Now, have you noticed something about them? Because they're seeking for power apart from the living God, they're destroying everything they touch. They've got a senile president known all over the world for his weakness. The whole country is coming unraveled. The more they seek power apart from the living God, the more they destroy the very thing they want to exert power over. So, uh, one, a lot of religions can be put under the title of power religion, and Pharaoh represented power religion. And then there's another kind of religion. And that's escapist religion. And escapist religion was religion of the Israelites in the wilderness. Escapism says that God's people uh, uh, talks about the inevitability of defeat for good people. That Christians and Christianity and the church are bound to lose. There's no hope for victory on earth in this life for Christians or the church. So do what you can to escape the hardships. Pray that the rapture will get here and get us out of here quickly so we can escape. Inevitability of defeat. Now, how did the Israelites express their escapist religion? How was God taking care of them in the wilderness? When they're wandering through the wilderness in 40 years, how did they eat? How did those three million people eat? They ate because God was miraculously sinned delicious manna out of the heavens that would drop out of the heavens just enough to feed everybody in your family for a whole day. You didn't even have to save up for the next day. And then there'd be more manna the next day and the next. A delicious white food of some sort. That goes great with quails. And so God would have winds come in and blow thousands and millions of quails from all over the desert where, to where Israel was so they could have quails with their manna. It's hot out there. You need some water. What fresh, cool, artesian water. So I want you to look at this photograph sometime on Google. Right at the base of Mount Sinai, there is this gigantic rock. You can take a picture of it. A gigantic rock that looks like a head of an axe. The problem is that uh, rock is split down the middle. And you look at the base of that rock and you can see where water used to run out of that rock. Gush and cause rivulets and gullies of water to come from that rock. And the children of Israel said, Moses, did you bring us out here to kill us? All we have to eat is manna and quails and water out of this rock. We want the leeks and onions that we were used to in slavery in Egypt. We were better off as slaves in Egypt. 
than we are as free men being provided for by the living God in the desert. Uh, you know, there are more slaves right now in the United States than there were in the United States in 1861. 1861, when the South broke away from the United States and made slavery legal, we talk about how, oh, how terrible they were, these mean old guys that they destroyed the United States so they could have a bunch of slaves. And we don't realize that there were hardly anybody that had any slaves in 1861. And there's far, far more slaves now than there were then. A slave in, in the South was a family member. And I'm not condoning everything the South did in slavery. But the, slave, but the slave was a family member. He had the master's name. Master cared for him, delivered his babies, took care of all his children when they were sick. Today, slaves are slaves of the state. They got a number. You get your 1040 form, and you put your Social Security number on the right-hand corner. Just so you got that social security number. That's the main thing. You got to get that right. Because you're a slave of the state. So, escapist religions always lead to slavery. Lead to slavery. Somebody who's an escapist is somebody that's wanting to escape the hardship of life wants to escape the burdens of life, wants to uh, uh, escape the responsibilities of life. Why do you think we have so many people on welfare? They want to escape not just the struggles, but the responsibilities. I want the state to give me money. I want the state to provide me a place to live, and I don't want to have to work for it. I want to escape the responsibilities. I want them to, to uh, take care of me. After all, I am entitled. So everybody has his entitlement. And we're all slaves of the state. Pharaoh... I'm sick. Pay for my health insurance. Pharaoh, I'm old. Pay for my Social Security. Pharaoh, I need more education. Pay for my education. And we could go on and on listing the things that Americans have become dependent upon the state for. One time I was with my sister in Texas, and we were driving along under an underpass, and there was a big healthy man standing there under the underpass. Had a beard, and dirty, big and strong and healthy. And he had a sign, and the sign said, I need food. And my sister's son worked for the welfare department. And I said to her, Linda, uh, why doesn't this guy get a job? He's healthy, he's strong. Why is he standing there on the, on the corner without dignity, begging other people to give him money? My sister laughed at me. She said, get my son to take you to the Social Security files, the welfare files. This man makes far more money than you make. At the time I was uh, having a Bible school in the mountains of Southwest Virginia, 
place called Van Sant, Virginia. And there was a family that we wanted to get to come to our Bible school, but they barely had any clothes on. The clothes was filthy. They were unwashed. Their hair was just thick. Uh, they looked terrible. And uh, the head elder of that church was the head of the welfare department. And I said to see him, Mr. So-and-so, why don't we give this family some money? It's obvious that they're starving to death. They're skinny. They're not dressed well. They're unhealthy. Let's give them some money. So Mr. Short said, come down to my office. So I went down to his welfare office. Now this family lived up a dirt road that was basically a dried up creek. And they lived in this little wooden cabin that had one light bulb, I've been to it, one light bulb hanging down from the living room. And the ceiling bowed like this because there'd been so many leaks in the roof that the water was gathering above the ceiling. And so I went to his office and he showed me the file on this family. This man made, fit. now this was in 1973. So money was worth, worth more in 1973. So this man, I should, looked at his file and this man made $15,000 a year. You know how much I made? I had four years of college and three years of seminary. And I pastored three churches. And I made $5,000. This guy. Who spent all his money on Reese cups and beer. $15,000 a year. You know how he did it? By saluting Pharaoh. By telling Pharaoh, I would rather you take care of me than me take care of myself. Have you ever noticed something? That escapist religionists always side with power religionists. Have you ever noticed that? Back in the days of Cromwell and uh, the Reformation in England, the people who were the weakest and who hated the Reformed faith would always side with the king against the Calvinists. So, you got to escape the escapist religionists. The Hebrews would rather have leeks. I like leeks, though. That'd be okay with me. Leeks and onions with no responsibility as slaves of the state. And then there was a third religion. Religion was the religion of Moses. And it was dominion religion. It was the religion that believed in the sovereignty of God. It believed that God was in control of all of life, not Pharaoh. It was opposed to tyranny. And it felt like its responsibility was to conquer culture by grace through righteousness. Did you notice that's the name of the sermon? Responsibility of Christians, according to Moses, and those who hold dominion religion. The purpose of Christians is to seek to conquer culture by grace, because human effort is not going to be enough. It could only be conquered by the sovereign, almighty grace of God through righteousness as we seek to obey the law of God. And as we seek to obey the law of God, the power of God will be manifested in our lives and cultures will be changed. There will be new cultures formed 
and the old culture is destroyed. That's what a dominion religionist is. He believes in the conquest of culture by grace through righteousness. Which one of those three are you? Are you a power religionist that believes that the goal of life is getting and maintaining and advancing power no matter who, who you have to step on? And that you belong to the state and must bow to the state's power? Uh, and, and so the state will take care of you so you don't have to take care of yourself. Or do you have an escapist religion? You believe with all of your heart and soul in the inevitability of the defeat of the church in history. The church doesn't have a chance. It's going to be destroyed. Christianity is going to be destroyed. And our only hope is that Jesus will come and rapture us out of here before he burns everything up. Or, do you believe that it's your responsibility to conquer culture by the grace of God who is to his law? You got Pharaoh, you got the cowardly Israelites, and you got Moses. Who's team are you on? All the religions in the world be categorized under Pharaoh, Hebrews, Moses. Let's look very quickly at the fifth chapter of Exodus. Fifth chapter of Exodus, I want you to get the picture because the picture here, what's going on here, you can't get out of your mind. Moses wanted to get out of speaking, you remember? So when God made him the leader, Moses said, Lord, you're not the, I'm not to be the leader because I cannot talk eloquently. And if I'm going to have to address Pharaoh and address all of Israel, I got to be able to make speeches. And I got to be able to talk eloquently. And so I stutter. And you don't want somebody that stutters that has to go into the palace of Pharaoh and, and tell him what to do. God says to Pharaoh, I mean to Moses, remember? Why do you think you stutter, Moses? Who made you stutter? I made you stutter. I make blind men blind. I make deaf men deaf. Don't go complaining to me about the fact that you stutter. I make men's mouths. And besides that, you got a brother. And your brother is eloquent. So here's what we're going to do. You're going to be God to him. I'm going to be God to you, and you're going to be God to him. What that means is, I'm going to tell you the words to speak, and then you're going to tell those same words to Aaron, and then Aaron's going to address them to the Hebrews. Just like I tell you what to say, you're going to tell Aaron what to say. And he's not going to speak anything other than what I told you. So the word of God is going to govern this whole ball game. I'm going to govern your mind and your thoughts, and I'm going to govern Aaron's thoughts as he speaks my thoughts that I put in your mind. And remember what inspiration is. It's God's thoughts in God's words. God took the thoughts uh, out of his own mind 
and put them in Moses or Paul's or Matthew, Mark, and Luke's minds and then didn't even leave it up to them to choose the words to express those thoughts. God not only took thoughts out of his own mind and placed them in the mind of the writers of Scripture, but he took words out of his own mind to express those thoughts and place those very words in the mind of Moses and the men that wrote Scripture. So that what you have is God-produced thoughts in God-produced words. And so, that's the heart of this story. The heart of this story is Moses and Aaron are going to go tell <laughs> Pharaoh they're going to answer the questions, those two questions, for Mr. Pharaoh. Mr. Pharaoh, we've come to tell you who Jehovah is. And we've come to tell you to whom Israel belongs. What I love about this story, Pharaoh, the most powerful man in the world, And we're two little 80 year old men. In the face of Pharaoh, said, You better get these questions right, buddy. Because you're going to have to stand before Jehovah. He's not going to stand before you. You've got to admit that as Pharaoh, you belong to him. He does not belong to you. And then God revealed himself to these people one more time and said, there's nothing to worry about, boys. Don't worry about going into the palace of Pharaoh. I am Jehovah. Don't ever forget that. Chapter 5. And after Moses and Aaron came and said to Pharaoh, Thus says Jehovah, the God of Israel, let my people go so they may celebrate a feast to me in the wilderness. I want them to worship me, Pharaoh, these two little men. Jehovah has told us, let God's people go so they can have a worship service. But Pharaoh said, who is Jehovah, this Jehovah? that I should obey his voice to let Jehovah go. To whom does Israel belong? Who is God? You're going to find out, Pharaoh. You are going to find out. I do not know Jehovah. Besides, I will not let Israel go. Then they said, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Two little men. The God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. We believe in atonement. We want to worship God. You can't worship God without an atonement because if we try to do that, his anger will fall upon us in terms of pestilence or the sword. We're more afraid of Jehovah than we are you, Pharaoh. But the king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why do you draw the people away from their work? Get back to your labors. Again, Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now many, and you would have them cease from their labors. You're trying to keep these people from being slaves. They belong to me. Don't you remember that, Moses? So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters and the people and the foremen, saying, You're no longer to give the people straw to make bricks as previously. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. They've got to learn to whom they belong. 
coat of bricks which they were making previously, you shall impose on them. You are not to reduce any of it because they're lazy. Therefore, they cry out, let us go and sacrifice to our God. After all, Moses, I am God. Maybe at the bottom of the up, turned upside down pyramid. But I'm God. Verse 9, let the labor be heavier on the men. Then let them work at it that they may pay no attention to false words. Why do you think Pharaoh was doing that? Why was Pharaoh making these people work so hard, impossible labor? Making bricks without straw in the sun, gigantic pyramids beaten while they're doing it. Mr. Weaken them, number one. He wants to uh, take their attention off of Moses. Get them to distrust Moses. Trust the state. We'll take care of you better than Moses did. Verse 10. So the taskmasters of the people and their foremen uh, went out and spoke to the people saying, Thus says Pharaoh, I am not going to give you any straw. You go and get straw for yourselves wherever you are confined it. But none of your labor will be reduced. The people scattered throughout all the land of Egypt to gather stubble for straw, and the taskmasters pressed them, saying, Complete your work quota, your daily amount, just as when you had straw. Moreover, the foremen of the sons of Israel, whom Pharaoh's taskmasters had set over them, were beaten and were asked, why have you not completed your required amount, either yesterday or today, in making brick as previous? They were trying to make them despondent, discouraged. Then the foreman of the sons of Israel came and cried out to Pharaoh, saying, Why do you deal this way with your servants? There is no straw given to your servants, yet they... Keep saying to us, make bricks, and behold, your servants are being beaten, but it's the fault of you and your own people. But he said, you're lazy, very lazy. Therefore, say, let us go and sacrifice to Jehovah. It's all just a trick. You want to get out of working, and so you get out of working by saying, you really want to go out in the wilderness to worship God. So go now and work. You shall be given no straw, yet you must deliver the quote of bricks. And the foreman of the sons of Israel saw that they were in trouble because they were told you must not reduce your daily amount of bricks. When they left Pharaoh's presence, they met Moses and Aaron as they were waiting for them. And they said to them, May Jehovah look upon, us, upon you and judge you for you have made us odious in Pharaoh's sight and in the sight of the servants to put a sword in his hand to kill us. So here were all these millions of Israelites who Moses led out of slavery into the wilderness on the way to the promised land to rebuild culture, where for 40 years they ate manna and quails and water out of a rock and all of these church members are saying, Moses, it's your fault. You brought us out here to kill us. With manas and quails and water out of a rock. You brought us out here to kill us. You're not taking good care of us. We're suffering because of you. And verse 22, then Moses, so what did Moses do? Here Moses, Pharaoh is becoming resistant. Pharaoh is making life worse for them. 
And now the very people that Moses wants to save, the very people that he that God's going to use him to deliver from slavery into the liberty of the law of God. Saying, Moses, you're failing us. So what would you do if you were Moses? Or complain to God? Verse 22. Then Moses returned to Jehovah and said, O Lord, why hast thou brought harm to this people? Why didst thou ever send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh to speak in thy name, he has done harm to this people, and thou hast not delivered thy people at all. Not only were the Hebrews despondent, saying, Lord, I just don't understand all this. Delivered this people from Egypt by the plagues, by the exodus, and now they're all complaining. So that says a great deal. Moses was human. Moses was a real man. He was a godly man. He was a great man. But he wasn't a perfect man. Because he took his eyes off of God. Looked at Pharaoh. Took his eyes off of God. And looked at the problem. And did Peter sink? When Peter was walking on the water with Jesus? And did Peter sink when he took his eyes off Jesus and looked at the water? So, you look at this Egyptian culture in which we live, and you say, Lord, I'm a, I'm a dominion religionist. I believe in the victory of the church over all of its enemies, and the farther we go, the worse we get thought you were bringing us in this situation and teaching us that we can tra- create, rec- uh, recreate culture by the grace of God through righteousness and through obedience to your law, and here things are getting worse for us. What would you just do? Took your eyes off Moses and looked at Pharaoh. You know what God sees when he looks at Pharaoh? A grasshopper. So every time you look at any of these politicians, don't let their little bark scare you at all. All grasshoppers, even the Bible says they're less than nothing. So you remember what Paul said, because it's going to be, you're going to remember, have to remember this more and more the farther you get into the wilderness. Don't walk by sight. Thought you was going to get us out of this, God. And you haven't. Now what? Who are you? So remember who God is. God always carries out his promises. So in chapter 6, which we won't get to today, it's just God renewing promise after promise after promise after promise. He said, you've forgotten who I am. 
am who I am. And nobody can make me any different. I'm not accountable to any human being for anything that I do. I don't stand in need of anything that, I, uh, that, uh, uh, that I've made. And moreover, I will take care of all of your problems. I'll solve all your needs. I'll lead you out of slavery through the wilderness into a land flowing with milk and honey. Just trust me. Don't trust Pharaoh. Don't even trust Moses. Moses doesn't have the strength to get you through here. I do. Father, it is so encouraging to watch Moses smash the very foundation of Egypt by smashing men's faith in Pharaoh as God. <coughs> Help us to continue to remember your name, O Lord, and that you will continue to defeat our enemies. And it's not that the failure is inevitable for the church. It is that success is impossible for the state. Apart from a church that finds its liberty in Christ alone. So Lord, help us not to walk by sight. But to walk by faith. For Christ's sake, amen.